Hi guys. Okay, I want to go ahead and um, finish up chapter 9 and get us into uh, chapter 10. Of course, the class has ended, but um, I want to go through some of the uh, key material that we still hadn't covered uh, during the class time. So we're going to start out in this module 4 here talking about encumbrances. And what happens with governments is anytime they order goods and some services, they are going to have to set up an encumbrance entry, which is basically showing that they have used up budget authority, they've used up some of their appropriation, even though they haven't actually received the goods or services yet. They have encumbered their budget, they have ordered those goods, and they have to show that encumbrance to avoid overspending. So you can see that an open purchase order, basically meaning that they have ordered something and haven't received it yet, represents an encumbrance or a commitment to the available appropriations of a government in order for government managers to effectively monitor the degree to which they have used their budget appropriations. Government accounting systems must not only reflect expenditures, but also obligations to spend purchase orders, and we call those encumbrances. Now, we're going to take a look at the encumbrance journal entry down here, and this is a very good example that we're going to take a look at. Um, this is an area of governmental accounting for the CPA exam, where a lot of times students get a little bit nervous because they say, gee, I feel like I'm doing some things backwards, just like when we looked at the estimated revenues and we looked at the appropriations uh, earlier. Um, so you're going to see that um, this actually kind of goes more in the order that you would think in terms of debits and credits, but you're going to have to get used to some new accounts here, and I'm going to ask you to flashcard those, okay? So let's just go ahead and let's look, take a look at this question. Assume that Progressive Township has budgeted appropriations of 100000 for two sanitation trucks. That's two garbage trucks. Then assume that the purchase order is issued to purchase the two sanitation trucks at an estimated cost of $45,000 each. Okay, now flashcard that when you order goods like that, these garbage trucks, you are to always debit encumbrances, credit budgetary control for what you estimate the cost of those items to be. Now, they may or may not come in at that actual cost. Of course, we want our budgeting our purchasing manager to be um, experienced enough, precise enough, whatever word you want to use, that they're going to get us pretty close, but there could be a small difference between the actual price and the amount that we set aside for the encumbrance. And that's actually the case in this example, that they tell us that the first truck, they ordered two, the first truck shows up, and it shows up at an actual invoice price of 44000 No problem. All you do when the goods actually come in, and you're going to continue your flashcard for the encumbrance process over here, you can make a second flashcard for this journal entry, is you reverse the original encumbrance entry for the original amount. So you simply reverse out, we had two trucks, so you simply reverse out the 45000 for that first truck, debit budgetary control, credit the encumbrance for 45000 and then you go ahead and set up the actual expenditure for the actual amount. And so we debit expenditure, credit vouchers payable, our fancy name for accounts payable and governmental accounting. What we do is we list all of our expenses on one voucher and then somebody goes ahead and approves that particular voucher. Uh, for the different amounts and so we call that a voucher payable it's a control technique it's a fancy way of saying accounts payable of course if we pay cash we would credit cash for that okay so you've got to know that process debit encumbrances credit budgetary control when you order the stuff when the stuff comes in don't worry about the original invoice price reverse it for the amount that you had originally encumbered it debit the budgetary control for the first truck, 45,000 credit encumbrance, 45,000, and then go ahead and debit expenditure and credit vouchers payable for the actual amount. Now, sometimes students will say, well, why bother if you're just gonna reverse it, why set it up? Well, we have an appropriation, and remember I showed you the revenues ledger 
the other night. Now I'm going to show you the uh, appropriations ledger here. And remember, when we get approved spending, we don't call it approved spending, we call it appropriation. We debit estimated revenue, credit the appropriation, right? Okay, so we have this appropriation, they're assuming of 100,000. Now when you order those two trucks, you debit encumbrance, okay? And at that moment, we know that we only have 10,000 left of our budget authority. So if somebody said, hey, I wanna order something worth 15,000, the answer would be no, because we don't have the budget authority to do that. So that encumbrance is a debit, it's sitting there as a placeholder against when we will finally go ahead and get the actual amount on the expenditure. So when we get that, then what? Then we are able to go ahead and credit the, uh, and it's not reserved for encumbrance, we credit the encumbrance, okay? We credit the encumbrance and when we do that, what happens? Then our budget authority for a split second comes back up but then we do what then we put the actual expenditure in for 44,000 so now we know we have 11,000 left of budget authority okay so now somebody said well we found something for 10,005 do we have budget authority left yes because we got an amount in different from what we ordered it again we don't want it to be tremendously off in price but if it's a little bit off, like this $1,000 or so, that's fine. Uh, we wanna keep our you know, encumbrance, it's pretty close to um, what we budget, or our actual expenditure is pretty close to what we budget for on our encumbrances, okay? Okay, good. Now, it is also important up here, flashcard, that uh, encumbrances are generally not used for reoccurring expenditures such as salaries, you can flashcard that. You can also put in um, same for uh, interest expense. Okay. And the idea here being look, you know how many employees you have. And so you appropriate what you need to make payroll. It's not like all of a sudden we accidentally hired some employees. So they don't make us go through the encumbrance process for reoccurring transactions like salaries, interest, you know what your outstanding debt is, you know what the interest rate is on that, you appropriate what you need to meet any debt service, okay? Okay, good, so that gets us through the encumbrance. Now, the rest of the story, well, what happens if there's still an encumbrance outstanding at the end of the year? Well, if that happens, say that second truck hadn't come in yet, then we would go ahead and reverse the encumbrance entry as though the goods had actually arrived. And then we're going to set up an amount called um, fund balance and it will either be committed or signed. And we're gonna talk about the different categories of fund balance here in a minute. And we'll set that up and that'll appear on the balance sheet. So now that users outside know that we have encumbered some of our budget authority. Okay, so notice what we do here. When the um, encumbrance is still outstanding at the end of the year, you basically reverse the encumbrance entry just like you would as though the goods came in. Debit the budgetary control, credit the encumbrance, and then in our real accounts, right on our balance sheet, we will go ahead and we will debit the unassigned fund balance. Unassigned fund balance means there's no uh, constraint against it and credit fund balance. And in this case, they chose committed. It could be fund balance uh, assigned. Now, what I want you to do is just put a little note here and put C page 51 for a second because I want to make sure that we understand where that's showing up on the balance sheet. And so I'm just going to go ahead and forward us a little bit ahead here. We'll come back to this other stuff. But let's just go ahead right here, page 51, okay? And uh, let's just take a look at the balance sheet for the general fund. Remember here, when we talk about encumbrances and budgetary entries, we're still talking about our governmental funds. Our general fund is the G and GRASP, is one of our governmental funds. And remember, we have current assets. We have what? Current liabilities. 
and then what our current assets equal our current liabilities plus our fund balance remember we said fund balance is like our retained earnings and then we're going to show the amount of constraint that is on our ability to spend our fund balance it's kind of like an appropriation to retain earnings but we have more categories than just appropriate and unappropriated retained earnings like we have in commercial here we have several categories and again I'm going to talk about the nature of these categories in a minute but the key point of this little exercise of going over to page 51 is notice we're showing a fund balance committed to sanitation so we took it out of what out of the unassigned right this uh, general fund had a total unassigned before we took it out of the unassigned of 1,527,000 and now we've set aside an amount for sanitation showing the world that hey we just can't spend all our money as we see fit because we have a uh, commitment out there for a garbage truck that we ordered that's going to be coming in okay so if you go back um, to the previous page let's just take a look also a little bit more at that pass key um, and I forgot what page we were on I think it was what like maybe 35 or something okay and uh, let's just go ahead and take a look at this and how it looks here uh, for the year outstanding encumbrance and just let's focus on to give us a lot of information here but I just want to focus right here okay so notice that what we got an appropriation of a hundred thousand so we had cash of a hundred thousand we had an unassigned appropriation of a hundred thousand now we spent forty four thousand and when we spent forty four thousand on that truck we had fifties that first truck we had fifty six thousand left now if we stopped right there and what didn't do anything the whole world would think that we had 56,000 that we could spend however we saw fit. They would think it was all unassigned, right? So what do we do? We come over here and we debit the unassigned, credit the committed fund balance, right? And now the world looks and they say, well, I see you have 56,000, but you have done that journal entry where you debited the unassigned for 45 so now there's only 11 you credited the committed for 45 that's 45 so of that 56 only 11,000 is left to be uh, actually uh, committed and of course we would have other transactions but as I showed you on page 51 whatever it was that that 50 um, excuse me, that 45,000 is standing out as amounts that have some sort of constraint on them, okay? All right, good. Now, of course, eventually that second truck is going to come in, okay? And so when it does, you would just go ahead and set up the expenditure, okay? When you get it, and they assume that it came in at the actual forty-five thousand. Okay, now they say of a prior year, you know, if that was twenty twenty when we ordered it, and then it finally came in in twenty twenty-one, then you know we would actually call out the year there uh, that that uh, budget authority had come from. Okay, okay, good. So let's just go ahead and let's take a look at a couple of multiple choice questions. I think you'll see. That if you make those couple of flashcards that I talked about, this encumbrance stuff, which can be scary if you've never seen it before, is actually not that bad. You just got to have those flashcards and get comfortable with this. Okay, so let's take a look at this first question here. Which internal account should Spring Township credit when it issues a purchase order? And I ask you to make that flashcard. We will do what? We will debit encumbrance. Or whatever it is and credit what credit bud control okay and you think well really they ask a question that simple yes because they figure that there's X amount of uh, candidates that don't even bother to study governmental meanwhile governmental ends up constituting you know as I said in the introduction maybe 15 points a bunch of multiple choice questions you're gonna see them guys and they're gonna be of this nature you get comfortable with these couple of things maybe you haven't seen before if you haven't had governmental this stuff is pretty easy 
Okay. Okay, good. Let's take a look at number two. Elm City issues a purchase order for supplies with an estimated cost of five thousand. When the plot supplies were received, the company invoice and the accompanying invoice indicated an actual price of forty nine fifty. What amount should Elm debit credit to budgetary control after the uh, supplies are received? Now look, we know that when you receive the things, you're going to debit budgetary control, so we can get rid of A pretty quickly, right? Okay, and then you just what I suggest you do when you get a question like this is just make the entire set of journal entries for the whole ordering and then the receipt. So when we order the goods, we would debit encumbrance 5,000, credit bud control 5,000, right? And then when the goods come in, okay, I'll change that to red, I guess, just to distinguish it. When the goods come in, you do what? You debit bud control for 5,000. You credit encumbrance for 5,000. And you would debit, I guess I'll write it over here, you would debit expenditure for the actual amount of 49.50 and credit vouchers payable or cash, whatever, that's BP vouchers payable, 49.50, okay? So it is obvious that what, after you do all that, what amount should Elm debit to budgetary control? Well, the answer is 5,000. Okay, all right, not that difficult. You do need to spend the time though and make the flashcard to get comfortable with those encumbrance entries and then you're in pretty good shape, okay? All right, good. Now, over here, we're going to talk about inner fund activity, okay? And we're gonna talk about inner fund activity as to whether it is reciprocal or non-reciprocal, okay? Reciprocal means that each side gets something, okay? Non-reciprocal means that one fund is essentially gonna transfer money over to the other fund and they're not gonna get anything back in return, okay? So let's just take a look at inner fund loans, okay? And let's just uh, pretend that the general fund loans loans money to the capital project fund, okay? Now in the general fund, they will go ahead and they will debit due from CPF, and I'm just gonna assume 10,000, okay? And they will, of course, credit cash because they're sending some money over. They're lending it, though. They expect it back. So if you expect it back, that's reciprocal, right? Okay. Now, when one fund loans another fund money, it's due from the fund that now is going to owe that money back. They don't credit accounts payable or loans payable. They credit due to GF as general fund. And, of course, they would owe them that 10000 and of course, the easy part of that journal entry is they debit the cash when they get the cash, okay? That's considered a reciprocal, and um, again, receivables and payables are really uh, considered due to due from the way I showed you there, okay? Okay, good. Now, what happens if inner service funds are provided and used? So remember, um, we said that what, that when you have a situation like that, uh, it's probably the internal service fund. Remember, provide service to the other funds, right? So let's say that the internal service fund provided service to the general fund, okay? So service is provided. I guess I'll put the arrow this way, I guess. I don't know. Service is provided. by the internal service fund, right? 
Okay. Now, if the internal service fund provides service to the general fund, the general fund will debit expenditure. I'm going to use the same amount now. 10,000. Credit, um, we'll just say due to internal service fund for 10,000. The internal service fund who provided the service will debit due to, uh, not due to, but due from, due, that says due from general fund, right? Because they did some work for them. They expect them to send them money. And then they're going to credit an account called billings. That billings, guys, is a revenue account. Okay, that says revenue. I know that's kind of small, but that says revenue. That's $10,000 of revenue that the Internal Service Fund has um, generated by providing service to who? To the general fund. The general fund has an expenditure. Okay. Now, both of these were seen as reciprocal because each side got something, right? The loan, hey, I'm giving you the money, but you got to pay it back. The service, you gave me the service, uh, now I owe you some money, right? In a non-reciprocal transfer, okay, now we're going to have an inter-fund transfer and money is going to flow from one fund to another and um, it is not going to constitute something that's going to be paid back, whatever, okay? So let's just come down here and let's just look at how that will work. And remember, we talked uh, earlier uh, in our discussion about um, other financing sources and uses. And we said that other financing sources are like non-operating revenue, but we don't call them that. We call them other financing sources. And other financing uses are like non-operating expenses, but we don't call them that. We call them other financing uses. Okay, so what happens here? Well, when you have a transfer like that, let's say the general fund, okay, is going to transfer and I'm going to stick with the $10,000 to, and we'll have it go to the debt service fund this time. Okay, now in the general fund, they will debit other financing uses transfer out for 10,000 and credit cash because they're literally transferring cash to the debt service fund in this example and they're not expecting to ever get that money back. It's a non-reciprocal transfer. The debt service fund will debit uh, cash, of course, for 10,000 and they will credit other financing sources transfer in for 10,000 and this is money that's coming from the general fund in this example and they're not going to expect to get that money back okay now what i want you to do for this whole transactions put c page 52 Okay, and I just want you to get a feel and understanding as to where other financing sources and uses show up on the um, balance sheet. Okay, so let's just go ahead and let's jump ourselves to what I say, page 52. Okay, and here we have, which is like the income statement. Again, for our general fund, we have revenues, right? Our property taxes, we have our expenditures, right? We have capital outlay when we spend money on a fixed asset. Remember, that's an expenditure. And then down here, we have our other financing sources and uses. And I didn't use the same amounts here, but notice that we showed transfers in, we chose so transfers out. So they literally are what? are basically being subtracted from this account called excess of revenue over expenditures. This is like operating 
income because it's revenue minus expenses, but we don't call it operating income. We call it excess or deficiency of revenues over expenditures. But flashcard that that shows up on the statement of revenues, expenditures, and change in fund balance, like our income statement, and it is like operating income. In fact, you could flashcard this whole statement, just shrink it down, flashcard the whole thing. After you mark it up the way I'm showing you, just go to your textbook and shrink this down and put it in with your flashcards. Okay, this is a good thing to have in your flashcards. Okay, transfers in, transfers out. Now, next to transfer in, you can put another flashcard. And the flashcard you're going to put here is name the two. I told John the two other financing sources. Name the two other financing sources. There's only two of them. And you can see that one of them is what? Transfer in. It's right there. The other one is going to be long term debt proceeds. The other one is long-term debt proceeds. So there are two other financing sources, transfer in and long-term debt proceeds. Okay, right here, you can put next to transfer out, name the one other financing use, answer, transfer out. The answer is transfer out and it's right there. There's only one other financing use, okay? I have you put that flashcard there, guys, because when I start to talk about other financing sources and uses, I find that students get, you know, confused because they're thinking there's a bunch of transfers out and transfers in. There's only one transfer out. It's, uh, I mean, there's only one other financing use that's transfer out and there's only two other financing sources, transfer in and long-term debt proceeds. Okay. Okay, good. So that's how you deal with those, um, you know, inner fund activity, the reciprocal, the non-reciprocal, as we were talking about back up there. Okay. All right, good. Let's go ahead then and let's take a look at the, um, next page here okay let me just to scroll down and um, let's just take a look at the next page down at the bottom deferred inflow and deferred outflow deferred inflow deferred outflow and you can flashcard this although we saw it when we were looking at our balance sheet earlier deferred outflows are having a positive effect on that position. They're kind of like an asset, but not quite. We list them with the assets. Deferred inflows, and we talked more about that when we were talking about uh, the situation where taxes wouldn't be collected within the 60-day period for a modified accrual accounting, and so we called it a deferred inflow when the money came in but we hadn't met specific time requirements, either being 60 days or when use may first begin. You can go back and look at that discussion that we talked about for deferred inflows. So they were sort of like between a liability, like an unearned revenue and a revenue. They weren't a revenue yet, so we couldn't feel comfortable putting them on the statement of revenues, expenditures, and change in fund balance. They're not quite a liability, so we carved out a special category for them called deferred inflow and we stuck them up next to our assets, okay? Okay, good, now you come down, okay, and I just wanna come all the way over and just sort of reiterate what we had in the example when we talked about the situation where we weren't gonna collect some things within 60 days, okay? And we said that for modified accrual, if you're not gonna collect something within 60 days, it's considered a deferred inflow. And we went through that one uh, problem together um, where we were talking about, um, you know, hey, um, 
you know, we had a question and they were asking us for modified accrual, whether it was going to be revenue. And then I went through the steps that, well, what if it was accrual? What if it was at the government wide? Then we would go ahead and we would start to have a discussion about uh, calling that uh, revenue for full accrual. Meanwhile, for modified accrual, it was uh, deferred inflow. And I kind of showed you the two, the difference between those. Okay. Okay, good. Let's go ahead then and let's take a look at a couple questions. Okay, so uh, let's see this first one. The city of Curtin had the following interfund transactions during the month of May. Billing by the internal service fund to a department financed by the general fund for services rendered in the amount of 5000 Transfer of 200000 from the general fund to establish a new enterprise fund. Routine transfer of 50000 from the general fund uh, to the debt service fund. And it wants to know what is the reciprocal. Well, that's what that's the 5000 for the services rendered are reciprocal. Uh, these others would be transfers. They would be considered non-reciprocal. So the answer here is this 5000 Okay, and then I had you highlight in flashcards essentially what was setting up this question. Assets such as property tax receivable associated with unavailable revenue such as property taxes collected more than 60 days after year end would create what? Would create a deferred inflow. Okay, those that are going to be collected after the 60 days would be a deferred inflow. And we had that example that I gave you with the sales taxes where there was that little bit that fell outside the 60 days. Full accrual, it's revenue. For modified accrual, it would have been deferred inflow. Okay? All right, good. Let's go ahead and uh, continue on here over to the next page. Okay, guys, let's go ahead and um, continue on. And as we were mentioning when we were talking about the encumbrances, we have various categories of our fund balance, okay? And these different categories of fund balance are really going to indicate constraint on the fund balance. In other words, what is the difficulty uh, that we would have in spending our fund balance? And so you can see that our fund balance can range from non-spendable to unassigned okay so we go and uh, you know this is pretty obvious we go from hardest to spend which of course is non-spendable I'm not trying to insult anyone's intelligence but from hardest to spend to easiest to spend okay that's the range that we're looking at from hardest to spend to easiest to spend okay and then we uh, range downward as our constraint becomes less now obviously okay non-spendable fund balance means we can't spend it and that represents assets that are in the form of a prepaid an inventory uh, something like that you can't spend it like cash try it sometime take uh, let's say you bought too much nutmeg at Costco. Try taking that to Safeway and say, will you take my inventory of nutmeg and turn it into milk? No, they're going to say, hey, give us some cash or some credit or something, but no, we're not going to take inventory and have you be able to spend it like cash, say at Safeway, right? So we have to call out to the extent that we have assets up there that we can't spend like cash. We carve those out into a category from balance called non-spendable. Okay, now just to give you a visual to go with that, okay, let's just go ahead and come down back to page 50, whatever it was, 51, I guess, okay, and notice that this general fund had inventories of 55,000, see that? 
And then when we come down to our categories of fund balance, we have, you know, total fund balance of 162,700. Some of that is non-spendable, some of that's committed, some of that's unassigned. But notice the what? 55,000 dedicated inventory is being called out as a non-spendable fund balance cuz you can't spend it like cash. Okay? Prepaid would be the same kind of thing. Anything that isn't going to generate cash at some point is going to be uh, considered a non-spendable uh, fund balance, all right? Now let's just go ahead and go back to where we were, okay, and look at our next category now. Our next category coming from hardest to spend to easiest. Let's see if I can find my mouse here to close that, okay, is restricted, okay? Now, if something is restricted, Okay, that means that there has been an external authority, such as creditors, go ahead and write in bondholders, who we have promised, people outside of the government, that we have promised we're going to use those funds that we receive for a certain way. So now maybe we have some cash, but we've told the bondholders we're going to spend that cash on the construction of some sort of capital asset or something. Well, when you do that, the bondholders say, hey, you've got to use that money for that purpose for the construction of a capital asset of some sort. That money is considered restricted. Okay. Now, we also talk about legislation. Okay. But it's important. Uh, well, let me come over grantors. Uh, the federal government gives us some money and they say, use this money to build a county court's house or use this money for infrastructure. You hear a lot about that in the news now that the federal government wants to be giving out money for infrastructure, right? And so what happens? Roads, bridges, that sort of thing. So what happened? That grantor gave us the money with the promise that we would use it for a specific purpose like that, so that money is restricted. Legislation, okay? And it's important to squeeze in here, we probably should have done this, the word enabling legislation because we're going to see that there's some legislation where we don't consider the money restricted enabling legislation yes we consider that money restricted because enabling legislation is the same legislation that allowed you to take that money to begin with for example take a state disability insurance okay what happens they pass a law that says we're going to start to withhold money from people's paycheck and that'll be used to fund a state disability insurance fund. Well, we don't want them to go and start using that money for something else. That money's restricted. And we consider it restricted because in order to decide to start to use the money that you took for disability insurance for another purpose, you'd have to go in and change the law and says, well, we're going to continue to take that money, but now we're going to use it for this purpose over here. That is considered such a legislative hurdle that the GASB decided that money should be called out as restricted. Now that is different than committed, okay? And we say the entity's highest decision-making authority has basically made a resolution as to how that money should be spent. So this is still what? This is still the legislative branch is the highest decision-making authority. I'd say, I thought the president, I thought the uh, governor was the highest uh, decision-making authority. When it comes to spending money, we consider Article 1 of the Constitution, we just consider when it comes to spending money, we consider the legislature as the highest decision-making authority. So once the legislature earmarks money that you already had, we have general taxes, but now we're earmarking this money. We're a school district to fund school sports, let's say. Well, if we do something like that and we take money we already have and had and we earmark it for some purpose, that money is considered committed because the legislature decided. The legislature can change its mind. It can say, well, now we're going to use this general tax money for something else and they, you're still having that pot of money. That is different than enabling legislation where what? They didn't even have the money until they passed the legislation that said that they would spend it in a certain way. Here, they have general tax money and they are earmarking it for some purpose. We call that committed. 
Okay. Now, when we get to a sign, and again, remember, we're going from hardest to spend to easily, uh, easiest to spend. Okay. This is now getting down to the government intends to obligate. This, guys, is happening at the city. I'm going to write it down here just so you don't confuse it with uh, committed. Okay. This is happening down here at the city manager's office level okay city managers what happens they've had some money appropriated and the legislation says okay you use the money for education well how to use that money for education well you could use that money to pay the light bill you could use that money to buy books let's say you order the books and uh, you're showing that you have assigned that money but then you decide well you know what we can wait another couple years on the books and what we really need now are desks, okay? And you go ahead and you reprogram that money to use for desks. You're still using it for education, which is how it was earmarked by the legislature, but now the city managers have the ability to move that money around. But if they make a decision that they're going to use it a certain way, it's a sign. Now, remember when we were talking about the encumbrance, we said the encumbrance could be called out as committed or as assigned. And in the case of the garbage trucks, they called it committed because those were probably special order. And now we are on the hook to actually take delivery of those trucks when they show up. But let's say instead they were just ordering some, thinking they were going to order some supplies, that they could cancel the order and the textbook provider isn't going to say, hey, you got to take these now because what else are we going to do on them? The textbook provider would probably give them some chance to cancel that order because all the textbook provider has to do is send that to a different school district. So that's why encumbrances could be committed if it's sort of like a special order item versus something more general. We might call it as a sign because the city managers can change their minds on that. Okay. And then unre unassigned, excuse me, means that they could spend it however they want. The city managers can. Now, that doesn't mean they can take you know, the government resources and spend them on the racetrack or something. When we say however we want, within the purview of their charter, education, whatever it is. Now, uh, only the general fund can have a positive unassigned fund balance because all the other funds are the capital project fund, the debt service fund. They have very specific purposes, so all their money would have some kind of constraint on it, only the general fund can have a positive unassigned. The others can have negative unassigned, but only the general fund can have a positive unassigned. Okay, now that's not a lot of information, but I wanted to save the flashcard. Did I say that's not a lot of information? That's a lot of information, but I wanted to save it for the flashcard down here. But let's mark this up a little bit, okay? categories, non-spendable, hardest to spend. You can go ahead and write that hardest to easiest is the way this thing goes. Okay. And by the way, sometimes you'll see that all of these are called out as spendable. Okay, you have non-spendable, and then all the rest of these are spendable in order of how hard they are to, uh, to spend. But you can see that the what um, for a practical matter, the monies have been spent, and then they leave out the best example. So I'll just write it in, which is inventory. Okay, okay, good. Now, when we have uh, restricted, we have what? We have bondholders. Let's just mark this thing up. And they say legislation, let's call it enabling legislation. It's enabling legislation, okay? Then committed, okay? You can put in legislature, earmark, earmarks money for a certain purpose. That says earmarks money. And then when it's intention, that's at the city manager level. 
and then uh, no constraints as to use within the charter of whatever the government is. And again, you already flashcard on the other page that only the um, general fund can have a positive unassigned. Okay, now we're going to get into other categories of net position uh, when we start to talk about the other funds later, uh, but for our enterprise fund and our internal service fund, okay, these are the categories for our governmental funds. For our internal service fund and our enterprise fund, they have three categories that give us the mnemonic run, restricted, unrestricted, and invested, net invested in capital assets. And I give you the mnemonic run for that, okay? And you have net invested in capital assets, restricted, and unrestricted. Okay, they're bringing that up here. It's a little annoying because they're bringing that up all in the middle of our discussion of our governmental funds. Uh, meanwhile, those are relevant to our proprietary funds, our internal service fund, and our enterprise fund. Okay, okay, good. So let's come over and let's take a look at a couple of questions here, okay? And general fund resources that are limited as to use by constraint imposed by law through constitutional, there's the phrase, or enabling legislation, that money is what? Restricted. We consider it restricted. Even though the legislature decided how that money is to be used, much as it is the case with the committed, if it's the same legislation, enabling legislation that allowed them to take that money to begin with, then we figure the hurdle on spend, on changing that uh, uh, restriction on how it's going to be spent, that constraint on how it's going to be spent, is a little higher hurdle than just deciding to reprogram money you already had. So we say, no, don't put it as committed, put it as restricted, okay? The only fund that should have a positive amount of unassigned, we saw, is the general fund. Okay. All right, guys, I know that stuff. Nobody wakes up in the morning saying, what are the categories of fund balance flashcard that sometimes I give my students a way of remembering that is by calling out a silly mnemonic spendable Raquel. Okay. So what do you have? You have non-spendable. And then you have all the spendables. Spendable Raquel is this guy I used to hang out with that would spend all his money. So we call him Spendable Raquel, okay? Which is what restricted, committed, assigned, unassigned is how you pronounce Raquel. You could think of it that way too. Or you could just go ahead and make up that flashcard that I just told you to. Uh, but know the categories, understand something about them, work with the questions, and uh, you'll be in good shape to feel comfortable with that material for your exam. You might get one or two questions like that, asking about that stuff on your exam, okay? Okay, guys, let's go ahead and continue on now. And um, what we're gonna start to do, we've talked about the funds, the governmental funds sort of generically for the last several um, pages now dealing with the encumbrances and the different categories of fund balance. And that applies to all of the governmental funds, general fund, special revenue fund, debt service fund, capital project fund, permanent fund, all use modified accrual accounting, current financial resources measurement focus, all of them would use those budgetary entries um, that we talked about um, on uh, some of the last several uh, pages and a little bit last time. So what we're going to do here now is start to call out some specific transactions related to these funds. I'm going to go a little bit quicker now because um, we're going to see that there's some repetition now as we start to talk about fun, uh, transactions in the funds that would be very similar uh, from one fund to the next. Okay, So we're going to just call out a couple of unique aspects about each of these funds. General fund. Uh, there's only one general fund, okay? It exists throughout the life of the governmental unit, okay? Revenue sources, largest variety of revenue, okay? We're going to have non-exchange, uh, you know, uh, imposed like property taxes, derived like income taxes, largest, uh, you know, 
categories of revenue, particularly uh, taxes. Okay, just going over again stuff we really already know. We are going to use modified accrual basis of accounting. Again, there's only one uh, general fund, and we're going to talk more in F10 about major funds, but uh, the general fund is always a major fund. We'll talk more about that when we get to F10. Uh, okay, financial statements. Remember, we said last time. All of the governmental funds prepare two financial statements, a balance sheet, okay, which is like a balance sheet, right? And then the statement of revenues, expenditures, and changing fund balance, which is like the income statement. And uh, we were looking at these earlier, current assets equal current liabilities plus fund balance. Fund balance, as you know by now, is like retained earnings. We have the different levels of constraint, committed, non-spendable right matches the inventory the fifty-five thousand committed uh for that sanitation truck remember and then uh, the unassigned you don't have to have all of the categories it just really depends on what's going on with that particular fund okay then what then we have our statement of revenues expenditures and changes of fund balance we were looking at this earlier this is like the income statement you have your revenues from your various sources expenditures uh, they give us different uh, different characterizations of these expenditures. For example, current is a character designation versus capital outlay. So even though capital outlay is an expenditure, notice if you say capital outlay expenditure, you know that this government has spent some money on stuff that will last uh, a little bit longer, right? Then what? Then you have other financing sources and uses, as I said. Those are like non-operating items, but we don't call them that. There is two other financing sources, transfers in and long-term debt proceeds. There is only one other financing use uh, that is our um, transfers out. And then don't forget that the difference between the revenue expenditures like, non, uh, like operating income, we don't call it that. Uh, we call it excess or deficiency of revenues over uh, expenditures, okay? Okay, good. So we really understand quite a bit about the general fund already. Special revenue fund is very similar to the general fund, but now instead of revenue coming from all these different sources like property tax and what now, now the revenue comes generally from a single source. And I gave you the example uh, back at the beginning, remember I did my wonderful drawing. We have a special revenue fund up here, which is this gas tax. Okay, we have a gas tax, and we do what? We keep track of the money that comes in as gas tax, and then the spending of it on road improvement. Okay, now they call out the um, nature of a special revenue fund as expendable trust, okay? So what does that mean? Well, expendable trust means you're going to spend both the principal and interest. You're gonna spend everything out of this fund. You spend all the money out of this fund towards that end road improvement or whatever it is. Uh, we're gonna look at the permanent fund in a couple of minutes and we're gonna see that the permanent fund is different and that you will hold the principal permanently that's the term permanent fund hold the principal forever but you can spend the interest so that's a flashcard that i'll give you later that'll contrast the nature of what happens in a special revenue fund where all the money is spent all the revenue special revenue that comes in like a gas tax is spent on road improvement versus a uh, permanent fund where you hang on to that principal okay Okay, so when you have those expendable trusts, that's accounted for in the special revenue fund, okay, where all the money is spent, okay? Okay, good. Now you come over and, um, you know, they quickly show us, well, I'm going to quickly show us, anyway, the financial statements, and they leave out the balance sheet. Just remember that there would be a balance sheet and a statement of revenues, expenditures, and changes in fund balance. I think they left out the balance sheet here because they didn't feel like creating a balance sheet for the special revenue fund. 
And the heavy hitter for a special revenue fund would be the income statement, the statement of revenues, expenditures, and change of fund balance, uh, simply because, uh, you know, they spend all the money. Okay, so balance sheet is not a significant. Okay, all right, let's go to our next. Remember, we're looking at governmental funds. Let's go to our next governmental fund, which is the debt service fund. So what happens? We issue debt. We're a government, we issue debt. Does the government have to pay the debt back? Yes, it does. So what state and local governments do is they establish something called a debt service fund. And the debt service fund's job is to service the debt. How do you service debt? You pay back the principal and interest. So the debt service fund is going to accumulate resources and then use those resources to do what? Pay back the principal and interest on. And it's not on all the debt of the government. It is on general obligation. Okay, debt. So what happens? Flashcard, very important because I've seen questions where the exam tried to trick you on this. The debt service fund only pays back debt that is issued by the other governmental funds. If any of the other funds, the proprietary fund, our internal service fund, our enterprise fund, or our fiduciary funds, pension, the employee trust fund, the, uh, the pension fund, employee pension fund, okay, the uh, custodial fund, uh, the investment trust fund, the other employee benefits, all of those things are going to be paying their own debt, okay? Only the grass funds get their debt serviced by the debt service fund, okay? Very important flashcard that examiners love to um, ask that. Okay. All right. Good. Oh, notice right here. Okay. We don't use encumbrances. Okay. We don't use encumbrances for the debt service fund. Just like we were saying for salaries earlier, we don't use encumbrances because we appropriate exactly what we need to meet our debt service. And so there's no need for encumbrance. It's not like a agent, uh, government entity all of a sudden borrows money that they didn't know about. They know what their outstanding debt is. They know what the interest rate is on that. And so they go ahead and appropriate what they need to meet the debt service. Okay. And there's no need for encumbrances. All right. Good. Now, revenue can come in from various sources. Notice here, we're talking about money coming in its other financing source. We're talking about a transfer in from the general fund. And this is a pretty common thing that you would see in a debt service fund because often the money to service the debt ends up coming from the general fund. So I often point out to my students, be careful because a lot of times you'll see in these ballot initiatives, do you approve the authorization of debt to build prisons? And, you know, everybody says, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, I want to lock people up. Let's authorize prisons, All right? That sounds good. And it's debt, so we don't have to pay it right now. Meanwhile, you're making what? You're making a law, you're setting up a long-term debt that you're going to have to use general fund money that maybe could be used for what? Something like education to fund the building of a prison, which you're going to have to what? you know, keep that prison running at some point, which means you're going to have to lock people up at some point in time. So be careful if you approve a long-term debt of an area you live in, an account or something you live in, make sure you're satisfied of what you're getting for that debt because it's probably the general fund that's going to have to pay back the principal and interest in that. And when they do, they'll transfer that money like this to the debt service fund. Okay. Now, in this example, um, we're saying that we're going to pull from the next section, the capital project fund, and basically the capital project fund issues some bonds. And in the example, they issue them at a premium of $80,000. And often the debt covenant, the restricted money that's coming in from the issues of those bonds will say the bond money will be used to construct something and that'll be accounted for in the capital project fund and if the bonds are issued a premium the premium needs to be sent over to the debt service fund to the project for the protection of bondholders it'll say something like that 
And if it says that, that means that the premium needs to be transferred over to the debt service fund. Now, I've asked them to fix this a couple times, but they seem resistant. They're trying to save ink, okay? Uh, that's an other financing source transfer in to the debt service fund from the capital project fund. Now, I think I have my page numbers uh, right here that I think the section in the next, uh, where they say the next section, the example, was this page 66. Yeah, here we'll see the money being transferred out of the capital project fund and into the debt service fund. So, um, so uh, let me get back to my debt service fund here. Again, so I've lost my mouse. Okay, so let's just go back to the debt service fund where we were a second ago. Okay, that's the money going out from the capital project fund that we'll get to later. Here's the money coming in to the capital project fund from the capital project fund to the debt service fund. This is coming into the debt service fund here. The cash is being debited and we're crediting the other financing source transfer in because often the bond covenant will say premium amounts needed to be sent over to the debt service fund, okay? Then we're going to see another transfer. And the only difference between this and the earlier entry up here is that this one is now a different amount. It's still an amount being transferred out of the capital project fund into the debt service fund. Apparently the capital project fund will see, and you can put C page 66 here. Apparently we'll see in the capital project fund when we go to those later pages, the capital project fund had some um, um, extra money that it wasn't using. It invested those idle funds, got some return on it. And again, the debt covenant often will say that any earnings on funds that aren't currently being used must be transferred over the debt service fund. And so that money's coming over, okay? And then the debt service fund doesn't you know, put the money you know, in a hole somewhere and hope that it earns interest, they'll take this money that they're getting, invest it, and earn some interest. So now this debt service fund has a pile of money, a pot of money that they're now going to use to do what? Pay the principal and interest on the general debt of the other governmental funds. And so we take a look here now, and we have a $2 million bond issue, 3% semi-annual bond. So we multiply that by six twelfths, and so to pay the interest, we debit expenditure, we credit cash, okay? Then what? Then we go ahead and we pay the principal back, debit expenditure, credit cash, okay? So notice principal and interest expenditure should be recorded when they are legally payable for the, um, bond agreement. There is no accrual of interest and principal payable. You don't do that. Now in commercial, if I issue a bond on January 1st and the next payment date will be the next January 1st, at December 31st, as a good accrual accountant, you'd want to accrue interest at December 31st. You do not do that in governmental. The interest expense for the period would be zero if that next interest payment isn't due until uh, January 1st of the next year. So a couple of important takeaways, both principal and interest are expenditures, right? The principal is treated as an expenditure because you're spending the money for the intended purpose and what? Do not accrue interest in between interest payment dates, probably the two principal things you really, really need to take away from the discussion of the debt service fund, all right? Okay, good. Now we come over and we take a look at our balance sheet. And this, let's remember it's current assets, current liabilities, modified accrual accounting, We're talking about one of our governmental funds. And then you have the fund balance. Yeah. It's probably all restricted because remember, we're supposed to use that money for the protection of bondholders, whatever, right? Okay. And uh, 
you come over, we talk about closing entries. Guys, the closing entries are no different than what we've talked about closing entries for any entity on the face of the earth. Governmental entities, okay, you have to close your budgetary accounts by debiting the budgetary control, assuming there was a surplus, and you're going to debit the appropriations, debit the estimated revenue, close your actual activity, okay, closing all those revenue sources and other financing sources, credit your expenditures to close those. Closing entries, guys, okay, make sure you are comfortable with the notion of closing entries, and again, I had you flashcard this earlier. Make sure you got a flashcard on this. Notice we spent that money out of the debt service fund and we did not encumber. Okay, you do not have to encumber um, the uh, for your debt service. Okay, and again, they give us uh, a few look a little look at the balance sheet and the statement of revenues, expenditures, and change in fund balance. The key takeaway uh, from these is the format is exactly as what we've seen for our general fund and our special revenue fund didn't have a balance sheet, but the statement of revenues, expenditures, and changing the fund balance example uh, is uh, in terms of uh, format is exactly what we've seen. Revenues minus expenditures, excess of revenue over expenditures, and then the other financing sources and uses to other financing sources, transfer in, long-term debt proceeds, one other financing use, transfer out. Okay, all right, good. Let's go ahead and let's take a look at a couple questions here, okay? And this first one, we've got this uh, Brandon, uh, well, let's go ahead and let's take a look at this one, see what we have here. Okay, so let's take a look at this first one here. Um, this Brandon County General Fund had the following transactions during the year. Uh, transfer to the Debt Service Fund, payment to Pension Trust Fund, purchase of equipment. What amount should Brandon County report for the General Fund as other financing uses? Well, there's only one other financing use it is what it is transfer okay the transfer is the one other financing use these payments and the purchase of equipment are both expenditures okay when a government makes a payment to the pension fund that's like part of the compensation expense for the government employees so they would debit expenditure credit cash and in the pension fund, the pension fund would debit cash and credit an account called additions, which is like revenue because they're making contribution on behalf of the employees to the uh, pension fund. So when the uh, general fund makes payments uh, to another fund like this, then that for, for um, required contributions of pension or a purchase of equipment, they're not even making a payment to another fund. Those are both the expenditures, right? Transfer is the only other financing use that's shown here. So the answer is 100,000, okay? All right, so make sure you remember that flashcard. What is the one other financing source? It is what it is transfer out, right? Okay. All right, good. Come over and let's take a look at number two here. And we got Central County received proceeds from various towns and cities for capital projects financed by the county's long-term debt. A special tax was a tax was assessed by each local government, and a portion of the tax was properly restricted to repay long-term debt. Well, if you've got money that's restricted to repay long-term debt, then where should that money go? That money goes to the debt service fund's job is to pay back the principal and interest uh, long-term debt. And that money's restricted because it has to be used specifically for that purpose of paying back the debt. Okay. Okay, good. Question number three here. The debt service fund of a governmental unit is used to account for the accumulation of resources for the payment of principal and interest, uh, principal and interest in connection with 
it does not do that for the proprietary fiduciary funds. The debt service fund only accounts for the payment of principal and interest of debt of the other governmental funds, right? Okay, good. Number four, on January 2nd, the city of Walton issued 500,000, 10 years, 7% general obligation bonds. Interest payable, interest is payable annually beginning January 2nd of the following year. Uh-oh. We're not going to have to pay anything until the next year. What amount of bond interest is Walton required to report in the statement of revenues, expenditures, and change in fund balance at September 30th? Setting you up to get into all kinds of weird accrual calculations here for nine months and all that when the easy answer is zero because that next interest payment isn't due until January of the next year. That would be... A expenditure of year two in this example uh, not of the first year that they're calling out here okay okay good good excellent I think uh, we made some good progress there okay guys let's go ahead and take a look at our next governmental fund now which is our capital project fund, okay? Now again, capital project fund is where we are going to accumulate resources, okay, for the construction of general government assets, okay? So again, not the proprietary fiduciary funds, okay? It's going to be for assets that are going to be used generally by the government, not for the pension, uh, not for the internal service fund, not for the enterprise fund. They have assets, but we're not going to account for the construction of those here. We would account for them appropriately, and we'll see later, in those related funds, in the enterprise fund, internal service fund, for example. But if we're constructing a you know, general use asset for this government, like a office building, um, convention center, county courthouse, that sort of thing, then that's accounted for in our capital project funds. So their job will be to accumulate resources and then pay them out for the construction of this asset. So the two typical sources of revenue here for our capital project fund are pretty much going to be bond proceeds and transfers from the uh, general fund okay so let's just go ahead though and let's take a look at how some of these will work and um, notice that uh, we could receive some sort of capital grant well that's another way that these capital project funds get money like the federal government will say hey we're giving you some money for the construction of a county courthouse or something okay and again they do this through various methods, um, infrastructure appropriation, like we've talked about, that sort of thing. So now I've got this money and uh, infrastructure grants that I guess President Biden is going to try to get to these uh, state and local governments that Congress will let them. And so what happens is, okay, here's some money. It comes in as a grant. If the money comes in as a grant, it is a revenue. Okay. Now you come over and uh, it could be that they get some money, but in order to have actually earned that money, they have to spend it. So if that's the case, we haven't met the eligibility requirement. Remember, for grants, uh, if it's government mandated or voluntary, we look, we do look, remember that chart I showed you last time, we do look to eligibility for these, right? For the government mandated and the voluntary non-exchange and here because they are saying well look you're not eligible unless you spend the money but sometimes they give them an account to draw on well they would debit cash and credit revenue collected in advance not deferred inflow deferred inflow is only used when you have met eligibility but not time here because they haven't spent the money yet they haven't met eligibility this is a true liability okay it's called revenue collected in advance you don't call it deferred revenue you call it revenue collected in advance but i'm just going to write in there it is a liability 
Okay, unlike deferred inflow is not a liability, it's a deferred inflow, meaning it's not quite a liability, it's not quite a revenue, because we're waiting to meet the time requirement. If you haven't met eligibility, it's a true liability, but you can't call it deferred revenue. You have to call it revenue collected in advance the way they've done here, and then it doesn't turn into a revenue until you do what? until you actually spend the money. Now you're eligible because they're saying, hey, you had to spend the money to be eligible for this. And so at that point in time, then you can debit the liability revenue collected in advance and credit revenue, okay? All right, good. Now, there could be special assessments and special assessments are taxes, fees levied against property owners who will benefit directly from the capital project. So what happens? We're going to put in a whole new set of sidewalks, but we're not going to raise tax money from the general citizens who maybe don't even have sidewalks or don't have fancy street lights. We're just going to assess it against those property owners that benefit directly from that project. Uh, you don't see those as much in California. You see this more, I must say, in states that say, oh, come to Nevada. We don't have any state income tax. Meanwhile, they sit there and they assess special assessment the hell out of everybody for every little thing, like connecting up and getting infrastructure for, you know, sewer pipes and that kind of stuff. So uh, be careful. You know, you think you're saving money by moving to a state that doesn't have any state income tax, and then all of a sudden you're paying all these special assessments, okay? Now, what happens? If the government is potentially or primarily liable for a special assessment, then we should account for the project in the capital project fund and the related debt in the uh, debt service fund, okay? And that would be the case that if bondholders uh, hold bonds that were issued and there's supposed to be a special assessment that will pay back, and let's say some sort of economic, you know, problem hits and, you know, all the, um, you know, people walk on those homes and stuff, Generally, you know, the uh, government isn't just going to let those bonds default. They'll back the, um, you know, they'll back the uh, bond holders. They'll secure the bond holders. So if that's the case, then the government is potentially primarily liable. You would account for that in the, um, uh, in the capital project fund. Okay. All right. Good. So just remember that flashcard that if the government is not potentially primarily liable, okay, then the government may be just collecting that special assessment on behalf of the um, residents in that area, whatever, because you pay it along with your property tax and stuff, but they're going to then transfer that money to somebody else. But if the bondholders default, the government is not potentially a primary, not the bondholders default, the property owners default, and they don't pay on that, and the government is not potentially primarily liable, then you would account for that transaction in the custodial fund. So go ahead and flashcard that. I know here in California, you're like, oh, do these things really exist? Yes, they do. Uh, you do see them in California as well, um, but um, you know, for our purposes, in case you get asked that, just go ahead and flashcard. Government's potentially primary liable for special assessment, account for the capital project fund, debt service fund. Government not potentially primary liable, account for that in the uh, custodial fund, okay? All right, good. Come over and uh, let's just take a look at some of the transactions that would go on in a capital project fund and we issue some bonds for two million eighty thousand faces two million so we credit other financing sources remember there were two other financing sources transfer in long-term debt proceeds here you go okay and then what then we go ahead and we credit the other financing sources for the premium eighty thousand okay both are other financing sources though right then what then we and we saw I even had you write in when we were looking at the debt service fund 
that we would have the money going for the premium going out to the debt service fund. So we debit other financing uses, transfer out to the debt service fund credit cash. Now in this example, they took the two million because they weren't ready to begin construction. They invested it. They got some interest revenue on the certificate of deposit or whatever. And often the law, yes, will read that you will need to send any investment earnings on idle funds to the protection of bondholders, means transfer it to the debt service fund. I showed you the other side of that entry when we were looking at the debt service fund. Just remember the one other financing use is a transfer out. That's what the capital project fund is doing here. Okay, so now they got this money and they're going to start to spend it on the project and notice that we're back to our encumbrance accounting. Yeah, capital project fund. Now you're ordering this uh, contract to construct this thing, whatever it is. You debit the expenditure, you credit the budget, uh, debit the encumbrances, credit the budgetary control. Then what? Then you get some billing and you're not sure what the final cost of the project is going to be. So you would just go ahead and reverse for the amount of the invoice, debit the expenditure, credit the vouchers payable. And then when you ultimately finish that thing up, then you would go ahead and reverse out the rest of the encumbrance and debit the expenditure, credit the uh, vouchers payable for the actual amount. Okay. Okay, good. Come over and uh, let's just uh, take a look at a couple of more things here. Um, short term borrowing. Okay, if it's short term borrowing, guys, short term borrowing is going to be what? Is going to be basically setting up a payable. So be careful if it says a short term borrowing, we do have current liabilities on our balance sheet. So that would be setting up a payable. Okay. Closing entries. I'm not going to go through. We've talked about closing entries now a number of times. There's nothing new here that we haven't seen before. Okay. Okay, good. Let's just go ahead and look at the financial statements more, not to see what's different, but to see what's the same current assets, current liabilities, fund balance. Yeah, restricted for capital projects because that's what the capital project fund does. It gets money to spend on capital projects, statement of revenues, expenditures and changes in fund balance, excess deficiency of revenue over expenditures. And then we have our other financing sources and uses. So same format we've seen for the statement of revenues, expenditures and change in fund balance now several times. Okay. All right. Good. Permanent fund. What happens here with the permanent fund? As I mentioned earlier, you do what? You only spend the interest. So somebody gives the government money, says, hang on to the corpus, to the principal forever, but you can spend the interest. Okay. So let's just go ahead and take a look here. Um, we don't use encumbrances and you can flash card for the debt service fund nor for the permanent fund because again we're controlled our budgetary control is not having to be established through encumbrance because we're controlled by we can only spend the uh interest right okay and then you come over and um as i had said earlier when we were talking about the special revenue fund by contrast the special revenue fund sends principal and interest the permanent fund you only spend the principal, right? Okay, good. Let's take a look at a couple of questions here. Let's look at question number one. A capital project fund for a new city courthouse recorded a receivable of 300000 for a state grant. Okay, well, there's a grant. 300000 and 450000 transfer from the general fund. What should we report as revenue? Grants are revenue, right? Taxes are revenue. Transfers in are other financing source. So we're only going to pick up that what? That 300000 is the revenue. Okay. Okay, good. Let's go ahead and let's take a look at this one. And this Japes City issued a million dollar general obligation bond at 101 to build a new city hall. 
As part of the bond issue, the city also paid $500 underwriting fee, underwriter fees in 2000 in debt issue costs. What amount should they report as other financing sources? Well, look, if it's a million dollar bond issue, right? And you sit there and you issue that at 101, that means that you issued this for what? For um, 1 million, where's my calculation guys? 1 million, 10,000, okay? So I would credit other financing sources, 1 million, 10,000 for the money that came in, right? Now what's gonna happen? Now, I have these, I'm not gonna get this full 1 million 10,000 because I have what, $2,500 in underwriting fees and bond issue costs, etc. okay? So what happens? When I get my cash on this deal, I'm going to get 1 million 500 because I've gotta pay those fees. And so then you might say, well, what's the debit going to be to? Well, it's the debt service fund's job to sit there and what? And pay this kind of stuff off, right? So I'm going to sit here and say, hey, do from debt service fund for the $2,500 because it's their job to pay this, right? But then what's going to happen? Well, I do have this. $10,000 premium and generally premium amounts are sent over to the debt service fund. So what am I going to do? I'm going to credit cash for $7,500. Okay. And then I'm going to do what? I'm going to credit do, um, excuse me, I'm going to debit do from debt service fund. Excuse me. <sighs> debit credit John I'm going to credit due from debt service fund right because now I've kind of you know they're not gonna send the money and then send it back right so I can go ahead and credit due from debt service fund and um, now I can go ahead and debit my transfer out for 10,000, my other financing use transfer out because I have in effect transferred 10,000 to the debt service fund. You say, well, you didn't really transfer 10,000. Well, I didn't send them 10,000 cash, but they were supposed to send the cash over to pay for those. It's their job to pay those amounts. And so I sent them over, you know, what was left after that got paid, right? And so I credited the cash for the 7,500, okay? But the answer to this question is what? Is the 1,010,000 that would have gone uh, as the other financing source for the money that came in to the uh, debt service fund, just like we saw in our little example. And then how we settle up with the debt service fund was not relevant to this question, okay? Okay, good. Uh, we saw in our example, remember the whole amount that came in, to the capital project fund, the two million and the eighty thousand was both uh, a other financing source from the uh, bond proceeds, right? Okay, okay, good. And then Tang City received land from a donor who stipulated the land must remain intact, but any income generated from the property may be used for general government services. Okay, that's obviously our permanent fund. Okay. All right, I think that gets us through chapter nine, but what I'm gonna do as part and parcel of our discussion right now here is I'm gonna jump us into chapter 10 and get us through um, the remainder of the discussion for the proprietary funds and the fiduciary funds, okay? And then we'll have a separate lecture for the rest of chapter 10. But I wanna finish up our proprietary funds and our fiduciary funds, okay? So let's go ahead and uh, get ready for that now as I open up the other file for the remainder remaining. Okay, guys, let's go ahead then and let's get ourselves into 
uh, part of chapter 10 in this recording. We're going to have to come back for this other part um, a little bit later. So we're just going to cover these parts up here, which are fairly light uh, on the exam. So what we've covered in chapter 9 about governmental constitutes most of those 15 points. You'll see a few points uh, in this area and then maybe five points down here in this area that we will cover um, later um, in another lecture that I'll be posting up. Um, a lot of information guys, it just takes us some time to get everything up for, so that uh, you can take a look at it for your exam, okay? So I apologize, it's taking a little time. I'm doing the best I can to get it all up there for you, okay? So let's just go ahead and let's take a look at our proprietary funds, okay? And let's look at our internal service fund. Remember, there's two proprietary funds, internal service fund and the enterprise fund, okay? Remember, for our uh, proprietary funds, in fact, the remainder of our funds now, we use what? full accrual accounting. We're going to have long-term assets, long-term liabilities, etc. Okay. Um, internal service fund is set up to provide services to who? The other governmental funds. So again, as we said before, when we we're talking about internal service fund last time, um, you know, you can't take your car to be worked on in the internal service fund, police cars, fire trucks, yes, okay? And so they will basically, on a cost reimbursement basis, okay, they're not sitting there trying to turn a huge profit, they're just trying to cover their costs, but they will charge the other funds uh, for the work that they're providing them, okay? So when we take a look at their revenue source, it really is operating revenue. You know, they're providing the service. The only thing is, okay, that I want you to flashcard the name of the operating revenue account. It's called billings, okay? So that's not something that you typically think of as a revenue account name. And notice it's due from, it is not account receivable. So flashcard that entry when they provide uh, service, okay? Now, just like you would in commercial, we will have non-operating things, and you're saying, hey, this is starting to sound like chapter F1 all over again, okay? So things like mechanic salaries, whatever, would be operating, non, um, would be operating expenses right here, okay? Um, non-operating revenues and expenses, classic example, are our interest items, right? Okay, so I said that a little backwards. Let me come back. Non-operating revenue would be interest revenue. Operating expenses, things like mechanic salaries, day-to-day, -day, just like we talked about in F1. We're back to full accrual accounting, right? And then when we talk about non-operating expenses, classic example there would be uh, interest expense. Okay, now if we are establishing an internal service fund, okay, and the money is coming from a non-reciprocal transfer, then we would go ahead and debit cash interfund transfer, or if it's some sort of what, some sort of contribution coming from one of the other funds, credit contribution, often the way they will establish an internal service fund is simply to issue some long-term debt, and since we're back on full accrual accounting, we would go ahead and debit cash, credit, bond, payable, right? Okay. If we get a loan from one of the other funds, okay, and we're going to have to pay them back, we would simply credit due to the other fund. All right. All right. Good. Now, when you look at this statement of net position, statement of net position is basically the balance sheet. Notice we have both current and non-current assets, right? Current and non-current liabilities going over to the next page, okay? I'm just showing you that it's full accrual accounting. And then our three categories of net position, as I said earlier, for our proprietary funds, 
Okay, we don't have the five categories of fund balance. We have three categories, and it's called net position, not fund balance. And remember, I gave you the mnemonic run for that. So make sure you know the categories of net position uh, for our, I might have said net assets, net position for our uh, proprietary funds. Okay, all right, good. Let's talk about our... And I said proprietary funds, that was our internal service fund, but the enterprise fund has the same three categories of net position, okay? Now, when we deal with our enterprise fund, it is operated in a manner that is similar to private business, okay? Now, they do ask questions sometimes. It would say, well, what would constitute accounting for an activity as an enterprise fund, okay? And the key thing is that it's being run by fees, okay, by fees and charges to recover costs, okay? Now, if you see that phrase, then you know that's a um, enterprise fund. The only thing that makes it a little bit different is sometimes they'll say that it's financed with debt that is covered by the fees and services, the revenue. But at the end of the day, for all of these things, it's what? It's fees and for services and charges for services that are covering the cost. So if you start to see that kind of a phrase in there, that means it's an enterprise fund, okay? Now you could also have public benefit corporation, and uh, such as low cost housing, promote development and stuff, those would also be accounted for as an enterprise fund, so you can flashcard that, okay? Revenue sources, just like we saw for the internal service fund are gonna be our operating revenue, but now instead of it being charged to the other funds, it's charged to those that use that service, such as billings for public utilities, et cetera, right? We'll have non-operating revenue. Again, classic examples, interest. Shared revenue, what happens here? Shared revenue, okay, is going to be considered non-operating revenue. Go ahead and flashcard that, okay? So what happens? We have a gas tax that comes in now to the state, and the state might account for that in a... Um, in a special revenue fund when it comes into the state, but then the state decides which roads are going to get that money uh, in the particular state. Well, when that money is shared amongst different highways and roads within the state, that shared revenue is considered um, operating, okay? So um, even though they be getting, I mean, it's not operating, it's non-operating, it's considered non-operating, the shared revenue. So you could have a road here, and we don't have these in California, okay? But a lot of states have toll roads. Again, the ones that don't pay any tax, they have toll roads. No, no, come to Florida, no state tax. Meanwhile, every time you go 10 miles down the road, you gotta pay a toll, okay? But what happens? We have these toll roads, the tolls, are used to cover the cost of the road. So the road would be accounted for as an enterprise fund. But at the same time, right, they may get some gas tax money, okay, from the state that will come to these different roads as well. Now, most of the money, I mean, they tried to make the box bigger, is coming from user charges, tolls, so it is considered an enterprise fund. But then that gas tax may also be going over to this road and to this highway and whatnot. And so those are shared revenues. Shared revenues are considered non-operating, okay? All right, good. Now you come over and you have your operating expenses, okay? Which are your normal things such as personnel services, utilities, salaries. Non-operating classic example there is going to be our interest, okay? Okay, good. If there is a capital contribution that comes in to start up the internal service fund that is reported as a capital contribution, 
that is an income statement item, guys. Okay, that's just money that's being contributed. You can flashcard that if you want to. Okay, then they could issue bonds. And again, because they're on full, full accounting, just like you learned a long time ago, debit the bond payable. Okay, municipal landfill. Okay, what happens here? Well, a um, you know city has a dump. Okay, the landfill, right? The dump. And what happens? They sit there and they're putting all this garbage and the federal government come down some years ago. So you're going to have to clean all that up. So Gasby looks at that and says, well, then you're going to have to figure out what costs are going to go into the cleanup. So what they do is they create a pool and they put all of those costs into a pool. Okay, and I want you to flashcard the nature of these costs, okay, just in case you get a one-off question on that. And then as you fill the hole up, you go ahead and debit expense and credit a liability as you fill that hole up. So let's say you're sitting there and you have a million dollars that go into that uh, pool of these different things, the equipment, the gas monitoring, etc. Flashcard the nature of the items that go into that pool. And let's say you have your engineering estimates say, well, you've used up about 30% this year of the entire space available in this landfill. So 30% of a million is 30,000. So you would debit expense. 30,000 and you would go ahead and credit the liability 30,000. It is somewhat similar to what we talked about our um, accounting for our ARO, the um, asset remedial obligation, whatever that was called, the ARO a few chapters back, I guess it was chapter four, similar concept, okay? Not a big deal, just flashcard the nature of those costs that would go uh, into that pool, okay? Balance sheet, statement of net position, okay? Don't forget, guys, full accrual, current and non-current assets, all the way across, current and non-current liabilities, okay? Net position, three categories, restricted, unrestricted net, invested in capital assets, okay? Um, for our statement of revenues, expenses, and changes in net position, um, operating revenue, non-operating items, revenue and expenses, just like F1, right? Okay. Don't forget the change in net position, of course, is like our net income. Okay. So the enterprise fund, the internal service fund, very, very similar looks. They also both prepare a statement of cash flows. The statement of cash flows we'll talk about more in F10. Statement of cash flows is only prepared for the um, proprietary funds. Only the internal service fund, only the enterprise fund prepare a statement of cash flows. And we're going to talk more about that in Chapter 10 when we get to it, okay? Okay, good. Let's go ahead and take a look at a couple questions now for our proprietary funds. The billing of transportation services provided to other governmental units are recorded by the internal service fund as what? And you look and you say, well, those billings are considered what? Billings, right, are considered operating revenue. Okay, okay, good. Let's take a look at this one. Size cities, municipal solid landfill. Enterprise Fund has established when a new landfill was opened January 3rd, year 1. The landfill is expected to close December 31st, year 20. Size Cities Year 1 expense would include a portion of which of the year 21, those costs that they put into the pool, and I went through that kind of quickly, but the costs I had you flashcard included costs for um, final covering and um, the gas monitoring equipment. When you bury garbage, it builds up this methane gas, and that methane gas stays there forever in a landfill. And then you've got to turn around and monitor that gas to make sure that it doesn't come out and kill people who are playing in a park that's on top of a landfill somewhere. And so um, you got to put both of those. And I had you put that on the flashcard. Okay. 
Okay, good. A state had the following activities. A state operated lottery, state operated hospital. Which activities should be most likely accounted for as an enterprise fund? You know, I don't think that they should have you guessing as to the nature of the activity and whether or not it's being covered by user charges. I could see maybe if they just had the state operated lottery that then you would say, okay, definitely that one because obviously it's funded by people that are stupid. I mean, if, I mean people that are uh, interested enough to pay the lottery, right? Hospital ranges all kinds. I mean, some hospitals are just free hospitals, etc. But you probably would go ahead and say, well, generally they're going to charge you for some of the services and so the state operated hospital would also be included here. Not the best question and that I feel that they should have called out. Something is being supported by user charges. That's the key thing. That's what constitutes an enterprise fund and not have you guessing as to the nature of the activity of these funds. Okay, of these activities, this hospital, this lottery. Okay, good. Let's take a look at our fiduciary funds now. Okay, and um, let's just take a look. And uh, I don't want to go through the general of the fiduciary funds. I think we've had enough general discussion. Let's just start to get into uh, some of the specifics of these uh, fiduciary funds, which starts with our custodial fund. Okay, so what happens? We have our custodial fund, and uh, custodial funds generally collect cash to be held temporarily for an authorized recipient to who it will be distributed later. Okay, now they give us the example tax collection fund. Okay, so what happens? You pay your taxes to the county. So we have a county tax, a county property tax fund. Okay, and the county property tax fund does what? They go ahead and the person owns a house. Okay, person has a house and they pay their taxes to the county tax fund, say a thousand dollars. Okay, but then what happens? Then the county tax fund, and they'll probably keep a little bit of the money to pay for their operations, but then they'll go ahead and they'll pay that to the city that it belongs to, city one. City two, whatever the different cities are within the county borders that this county property tax fund collected that for. That's the nature of what happens in these um, in these uh, custodial funds. And it makes sense. Custodial, it's not really their money. They're just taking custody of it and then they're going to send it out to whoever it belongs to. Okay, so property taxes is a good example. Okay. Expense types are what? Then the property taxes, I'm just drawing a highlighted on the my drawing there. The the expenses are the amounts that are going to be uh, distributed to the various uh, cities, the other governments they're saying, but it's typically cities that would then get that money that the county collected on their behalf. So when you pay your um, property taxes, you typically pay it to the county and then the county remits it to the uh, state, uh, to the cities, excuse me, okay? All right, good, come down and let's just take a look at the financial statement here. Only the proprietary funds prepare a statement of cash flows, okay? So notice we have the what? Statement of fiduciary net position current and non-current liabilities and the net position restricted for those other governments that money has to be uh, sent out to them okay then they prepare their statement of changes in fiduciary net position additions are basically the revenues deductions are the payment of the taxes although there may also be um, to the other to the other governments, although there may also be some administrative expenses, change in that position. Notice, guys, is very very um, 
small, there might be a small balance left over as there's maybe some timing differences between when they collected and when they're gonna remit those monies over. But at the end of the day, they are essentially going to you know, distribute most of that money out after they've covered some of their administrative expenses. So like I said, they'll keep a little bit of it to pay for some of their expenses, but most of it, what well, most of the money that comes in gets distributed out in the form of uh, you know payments for the uh, taxes that they collected. I mean, it's almost you know complete match there the way they did this. Okay, and there might be some money that will be used for uh, administrative expenses. Okay, so small change in that position, but for the most part, these custodial funds take the money in, pay it out to somebody else. Okay, okay, good. So the most important because I don't think I had you flashcard a lot here, okay, um, is the revenue sources are called additions, flashcard that, okay, and the expense types are called deductions, okay, make sure you know the correct titles for your revenue and your expense accounts, additions for revenue, deductions for expenses, okay, all right, good. Let's come over then and let's take a look at our uh, next category of our proprietary fund, which is going to be our investment trust fund. Now, investment trust fund happens when various cities in a county take their investments and pull them at the county level and then the county is the one that handles the investments for the various cities and stuff, okay? Now, um, it gets a little bit scary in that, you know, you're kind of trusting this county to handle the investments properly, um, and that could bite you. That was the case with Orange County some years back. Uh, they didn't handle the investment trust fund very well, and it really hurt some cities in Orange County, okay? But as we said for our uh, custodial funds, revenues are called additions, expenses are called um, uh, deductions, okay? Now, um, note that it only reports external portion as in a separate investment trust fund flashcard that, but let me explain what that saying, okay? The county, okay, let's say it's the county that's holding this trust fund. The county's own investments are accounted for in whatever fund holds that investment. So let's say the general fund holds the investment. For the county's investment, uh, that would be accounted for in the general fund. But when the county starts taking investment monies from entities outside of the county, okay, so say a neighboring county, a school district, say a city within the county, the, they're taking that money and they're investing that money. That goes in the investment trust fund. But the county itself, its investments are accounted for in whatever fund holds the investment say the general fund holds the investment, that investment that's held in the county's name would be accounted for in the, um, on the county's behalf would be accounted for in the county's general fund. So it's only those investments that are external, okay? Now, when we account for the investments, we use fair value. I mean, that's pretty consistent across most of everything we've talked about here. Investments are accounted for at fair value okay all right good let's come down and let's take a look at the private purpose trust fund now and what happens with the private purpose trust fund now the government that we're doing the accounting for say the county is holding say the city is holding assets that belong to private organizations private individuals okay for example um, let's say you have a bank account and you have this bank account when you're a little kid and you forget about the bank account and you never come back and you don't do any activity in that bank account. What would happen? The bank after so much time would take that money and they would go ahead and they would give it to the state 
and then the state's job is supposedly to find you so that you can then come and claim that money, but it's being held by the state. They called it unclaimed property. Now, what you could do is you could go to the state of California's unclaimed property website, put in your name and whatever city you think you lived in when you lost track of the money, and they will tell you, hey, you know, you've got so much money coming to you. I've done this a couple times, and I got like, uh, you know, 50 bucks one time. I did it for my brother. I told him he has 50 bucks, but he never claimed it. So I gave up on him. I kept telling him, you got 50 bucks, you should go get it. Oh, I don't feel like doing it. So, okay, whatever. But that sort of activity is called a cheap property, okay? And this is cheap property is basically unclaimed uh, property, okay? So um, the revenue source of the private purpose trust fund Okay, is private individuals, etc. Okay, a street property funds. Okay, again, um, unclaimed property essentially. Okay, the revenue is what is the money coming in. Okay, and so we would go ahead and have that money coming in, and in the private purpose trust fund. They will go ahead and um, journal entry to record obligation of a private individual, debit, deduction, and credit the account payable. Uh, when the money comes in, of course, it would be account payable. And um, it, when you pay the money out, I should say to those individuals, uh, debit account payable and credit cash. Okay. Our expenses are our deductions. All right. Okay, so just a little bit about our uh, fiduciary funds, okay? Pension, trust fund, revenues are the money coming in, employer, employee contributions, okay? Uh, so the money comes in from both employees and employers, okay? Then what? Then we go ahead and make sure if you get a question, guys, you know what side of the accounting you're doing because sometimes they'll ask you the accounting of the general fund to pay money to the pension fund because the general fund pays money to the pension fund because the general fund is where salaries are being paid and if they're supposed to pay that money over to the pension fund for the employee or for the employees then that would be a debit to expenditure and a credit to cash if it was, say, one of the proprietary funds that was paying the, say, enterprise fund, then it'd be a debit to an expense and a credit to cash, okay? Deduction types, okay, are going to be the benefit payments, et cetera, okay? Okay, good. So the money comes in, and then, you know, the money's paid out, um, but this is still money coming in right here where it's just showing you the uh, journal entry for the fund that's funding the pension here. And then when the money's paid out, it's expenses, benefit payments. Sometimes people leave and want to be refunded their uh, money that was contributed, etc. Okay. Okay, good. Come over and... Um, Let's just take a look, and I'm not going to start to get into, you know, pension accounting here, guys. That's going to go, um, you know, way over the top of what uh, the level of um, accounting we need to know for our pensions, okay? Asset valuation, fair value, okay? And then you come over and you take a look at the statement and of course most of this stuff is at fair value please don't let my pension have any junk bonds in there right good setup addition uh, good setup of fair values there for different good investments additions are like revenue that's the contributions deductions are like expenses okay so we've seen that consistently through our proprietary funds you can see the nature of both employer and employees contribute just make sure you understand that when you're looking at a question that you understand if they're mentioning the pension fund what I find annoying is sometimes they're actually asking you the journal entry for the general fund in fact we had a question 
where they said, hey, which of these would be, I think they were asking us other financing sources. And remember I said, hey, contribution to the pension is actually an expense of the general fund and it's in a revenue, or we call it addition. It's a revenue, although we call it addition, of the pension fund, okay? Okay, good. That's where I wanna stop, okay, with the fiduciary funds. Uh, but let's go ahead and let's do take a look at a couple of the multiple choice questions here for the uh, fiduciary funds. And then we're going to stop. We'll be done with all the funds and we're going to have to take a look at the government wide stuff at a separate time. OK. All right. Good. So let's take a look. Fish property owners in C County are responsible for special assessment debt that arose from a storm sewer project. If the uh, property owners default, C has no obligation regarding debt service. Stop. That means that what? That means that the government is not potentially the C, whatever county, is not potentially liable for this. And we said this back when we were talking about the capital project fund. That means that's accounted for in the custodial fund when the government is not potentially a primary liable for that. Okay. Okay, good. Arlen City accounts contain the following. Forfeiture act cash compensated from illegal activities. Disbursements can be used for law enforcement activities. Sales tax collected by Arlen to be distributed to other governmental units. Well, I look at that right now. I know that's custodial fund. Right? And then I'm seeing here they want to know private purpose. Forfeiture act confiscated from illegal activities. Disbursement can be used for law enforcement. That sounds like a special revenue fund to me. The special revenue is what? The money they confiscate. And frankly, I think they should stop doing these drug seizure busts because they risk versus the reward is very uh very poor and so they make it sound like you know we got all this money coming in from these meanwhile people are getting killed on these things all the time but anyway stop john that's going to be a special revenue fund the money comes in and the money gets dispersed uh, for law enforcement activities but i think they should stop all of this none of it is private purpose okay? private purpose is what we collected money on behalf of private organizations, individuals, and we're holding that money waiting for them to come and claim it. That's what happens in the private purpose trust fund. Okay, guys, that is going to be the end of this lecture. We're going to have to come back and get the rest of chapter 10 at another time. I'll be setting aside some time to post that up, so stay tuned. Okay, thanks for your patience. A lot of information, as you can tell. But you're in good shape now to get most of the points now for the governmental between the lecture we had last time and the information I've recorded here today. Okay? All right, guys. I'll see you soon.